There was once a king who ruled a land in the cold north. He was a hard man with an iron will, and rather than loving him, people feared him. He was not only hard, but he was also cruel, and he would think nothing of punishing anyone who offended him by taking their lives, and he enjoyed thinking up new ways of doing so. One day he was walking with his dog along the banks of the lake upon which he had built his palace. It was early winter, and on the lake there were already small patches of ice forming on the surface of the water. He walked along throwing a stick which his dog, with a yelp and a wag of the tail, would run off to retrieve. The king loved to do this. It seemed so pointless an exercise to him, which made a change from all the business he had to do as a king of a great country. As he came closer to the lake, he threw the stick into the water, but instead of jumping in after it, as the dog usually did, it just stood there barking out towards the place where the stick had landed. The king caught up with the dog and encouraged it to go in, but each time the dog put a paw into the water, it pulled back from the edge and just stood there whining. The king wondered why this was. Perhaps the water was cold. So the king took off one of his boots and dipped his foot into the water which he swiftly removed. The water was very, very cold. So the stick remained in the water, and he and his dog returned to the palace. That evening, as he sat by the fire looking out across the lake, he began to wonder about how cold the water was. How is it that the dog knew that the water would be too cold to swim in? How long would a body survive in such cold water? These questions kept him awake long into the night, until he decided that he had to find the answers. He was a king, therefore he must know everything. But how could he find out? He could just get a slave, perhaps, or a prisoner, and throw them into the water. He had such cruel thoughts, but that just seemed too easy. No, he felt a bit of sport was to be had here. The next day, large notices appeared stuck to the walls in every town, stating that the king was to have a competition, a challenge. Anyone who could spend twenty-four hours standing up to their necks in the water of the lake without anything to keep them warm as they did so would gain anything that they should ask of him. The king knew very well that no human being could survive for so long in the almost frozen water, so he was sure that he would not have to honour his part of the deal. This was how he would find out how long a body could survive in the water. Many young men came, some poor, some rich, some idle in search of quick riches, others stupid but brave. People gathered at the lake in front of the palace to see the spectacle. The king sat up on his balcony to watch the proceedings, as one by one the hopeful and foolhardy went down to the lake. They stripped off and stepped into the water. They stood up to their necks. Some managed to remain in the water for twenty minutes or more, before half frozen they had to be dragged out by the ropes that were tied to their ankles. Most gave up after just a few minutes. The king was disappointed. But just as the crowds were getting ready to leave, a young sadhu appeared at the lakeside. He looked up at the king and announced that he would try to stand in the water for as long as the king had stated on his notices. The sadhu was so thin and looked so weak that the king could not imagine that he would succeed, so he waved a hand to the young man and told him to go in and try, but he should not forget that he was allowed nothing to keep him warm. The king sat down again to watch. The young man stepped into the lake, showing no expression as he did so. He went out to a place where the water was deep enough to cover his shoulders, and then he stood very still. He was serene and peaceful. He stared ahead of him, up at the balcony where the king was sitting. Even after an hour, his expression had not changed. The sadhu was used to hardships and discipline. He knew how to slow his heartbeat down, so that his breathing became almost imperceptible. The king watched him even more intently as the hours went by. The evening came and darkness began to fall. Still, the young man stood stock still in the water, his face wearing the same expression. He stared up to where the king was sitting, even though he could no longer see him clearly, for although the moon was full and strong, the king was sitting in the shadows, watching the madman in the water who did not move. The king, on the other hand, could see him very clearly, and he was beginning to worry. The water was much colder now, but he had slowed his heartbeat down so much that he did not feel the difference. 
time meant nothing to him. He was going to stay where he was until he was no longer able to do so. As the night drew on, he began to drift further into himself, deeper into his mind. He knew that if he could control his mind, then he could control his body. Had he have been less aware of this, and more aware of what was going on around him, he would have noticed little slithers of ice floating around him. One even bumped into his back, but he had lost all sense of feeling long ago, and he was no longer a part of his body. He had stepped out of it, and his existence was now purely in his mind. His eyes were the only parts of his body that connected him to the world, and they just stared ahead without blinking. Tiredness played no part in this. He had done many things in his life, in his training, that had pushed him to his limits. But the water was getting colder and his will, like his strength, was beginning to fade. Then he noticed a small flickering light appear in a window. The sadhu's gaze turned slightly towards it. Somebody had put a candle on the ledge of a window in a room next to the king's balcony. He kept his gaze fixed on this light. In the glow coming from the candle, he could see a face, a beautiful face. This was the face of the king's daughter, and she too had been watching the young man in the water. Now she had lit a candle as a sign to him that he was not alone. He became aware of her and saw that she was watching him. His willpower began to stir back to life. He could see in her expression that she had a great compassion for his plight, and it came to him that she would remain there as long as he remained in the water. She was willing him to stay alive. So instead of fading, he grew stronger. His breathing, still almost unapparent, grew steadier as he turned his eyes away from her face and stared into the bloom of the candle. When morning came, he was still alive, still standing up to his chin in the cold, almost frozen water of the lake. Twenty-four hours passed. As the guards pulled him out, the young man was unable to move, so they had to carry him up to the palace. As they did so, the king from his balcony heard the crowd which had returned, cheering for the sadhu, and he realised that now he would have to keep his part of the bargain. This worried him. At first they wrapped the young man in blankets, and then very slowly they warmed him up, using tepid and then gradually warmer water. After a few hours they put him near a small fire, and then towards evening he was able to move and to speak. The king begrudgingly congratulated him, and asked him how he had managed to stay alive in the water. The sadhu explained about his breathing and the importance of discipline, how he had learnt to master his own body and to control his willpower. Then he told the king about the candle that had appeared at the window ledge just as he was beginning to lose his will to live. At this the king clapped his hands and shouted out, Ha! I told you that you may not have anything to warm you, nothing to aid you, but there was a candle. That candle must have kept you warm. I'm sorry, my friend, but the deal is over. Relieved to have found a way to get out of the bargain, he gave the sadhu no further chance to speak and ordered the palace guards to throw the young man into the prison. This was done, and the king was spared having to reward the poor sadhu with any of his own riches. Some days later, the king was sitting at his breakfast table, he saw that his daughter had not joined him, and he asked the servants where she was, but none of them could answer him. She had not been seen for quite a while. When he did not see her that evening, the king began to get concerned. That night she was not seen in her rooms. She was nowhere to be found. Now the king began to worry. The next morning the king rode away on his horse, and he began to search for her. He travelled along the coast and through the mountains, he followed every track in the forests. He stopped in all of the villages along the way to search the houses. Wherever he went he asked about her, but nobody had seen her. Finally, after more than a week, he gave up. He turned his horse in the direction of the palace, and he began to ride home. It was late, when entering the woods that surrounded his home, he saw a light to the side of the road. He stopped his horse, and he got down to take a closer look. He pushed through the bushes and came into a clearing. He saw her sitting on the ground beneath a tree, staring into a candle. Where have you been? Nowhere, father. 
I have been sitting here. But you have been missing for more than a week. Where have you slept? She pointed to a pile of leaves. You can't sleep on a pile of leaves. And what have you been eating? You are a princess. Somebody must look after you. You cannot sleep out here. Somebody must feed you. You must come back with me now. Oh no, father, I cannot. I am waiting for my rice to cook. She pointed to the top of the tree where the king could see a cooking pot hanging from the uppermost branch. But how can you cook rice in a pot hanging in a tree? With this candle, father, I am warming it up. How stupid you are, daughter. A candle cannot be used to cook a pot of rice. It wouldn't even warm it from down here. But father, you said that a candle had kept the man in the lake warm. If that is so, as you say, then the same candle can warm the rice in my pot. The pot is hanging from the tree, the same distance away from the candle as the man was from the candle I put in the window. The king's heart went cold as he realised what she had done to him. She had shown him how pitiless he was. He saw her kind spirit, and he was ashamed. He blew out the candle and took her by the hand to his horse. When he arrived in the palace, he ordered the guards to fetch the sadhu. As the sadhu stood before him, the king said something he had never said before in his life. I am sorry. I have treated you unfairly. So please, I beg your forgiveness, and if you grant me that, I will grant you anything you wish for, anything that lies within my power to give to you. While he had been standing in the water and staring into the face of the princess, without knowing who she was, he had seen the compassion in her eyes. It was that that had kept him alive. He had understood then, and again later in his prison, how important unquestioning mercy for another human being can be. This understanding gave him a strength of purpose and mind. The sadhu forgave the king. The princess understood that true compassion was not simply a helpless pity for someone, but an awareness of their situation and a determination which demanded action. She had acted and then chosen her words carefully whilst holding up a mirror to her father's actions and through them had shown him how he, as a ruler, a leader of men, must behave. The king would change his ways and become a better man because of this. As for the wish, all the sadhu asked for was a place to sleep, enough food and peace in which to continue his meditations. The king granted him his wish. Through her love, the princess had saved the life of the sadhu and changed that of her father. She remained happy for the rest of her life and the sadhu remained in the palace for the rest of his.